Well, who is ready tonight to kick off a brand new series? Come on, it's a good one. It's on relationships. It's called Real Talk. Sounds a little spicy, which means it's going to be good. But um, last night, our family actually had a pretty fun kickoff to this new series because my parents yesterday celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary. Pretty special. Come on, we love honoring and celebrating marriages. And last night, I asked my dad at the dinner table, I was like, Dad, you know, 30 years is a long time. But in the last year of your marriage, is there anything new that you've learned about mum? And he laughed. And his response was, everything. So I don't know what to take from that, but what I think we can take is that, you know what, no matter how close we are in our relationships, there is always more we can learn, and there is always more ways we can grow, and that is pretty much the heart behind this theme. Because the Bible has a lot to say about how it wants us to grow in our relationships. And yet we kind of live in this society where we've gotten into the habit of writing off biblical principles as being old, outdated. Sometimes we use the word traditional. But you know what? The Bible is not like our iPhone where we get it and then two months later there's a better thing out there. It's not like that. Just because something's old does not mean it's irrelevant. Sometimes it just means it stood the test of time. And the Word of God certainly has done that because the consequences of sin are still the same and the way to life and relationship are still the same. So during this series, we're praying that instead of coming to a place where we resist or even discount what the Bible would say to us about our relationships, just maybe it's time that we began to see some of these things with fresh eyes. And so tonight we're going to be talking about one of these things specifically that I really believe in our society we've dropped. And as a church, it's time for us to pick it back up and lead the way with this. So tonight, the title of my message, are you ready for it? Come on, it's The Hour of Honor. And if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to start here with our scripture for tonight. It comes from Romans 12, 9 to 10, which says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honour. Outdo one another in showing honour. What do you think of when you hear that word, honour? Because for each one of us, it might be different depending on where we come from. I was once um, traveling and I was alone by myself in a foreign country and I had some time to kill before a flight. So I decided to do something a little bit adventurous and I went to the cinema and I decided to walk in and it was a really nice cinema. It was pretty luxurious. It had like the reclining seat. You could kick your feet up. They even had a blanket you could tuck yourself in with. So I did that and I got my snacks on my lap ready for the film, not really noticing that nobody else around me was doing this yet. And I was about to find out why. Because the first picture that came up on the screen was of that country's leader, that nation's leader. And everyone in the cinema stood up to honour and respect. And I quickly had to do like this untuck of shame and stand up too out of respect. And I remember that being a bit of a culture shock for me because I thought, we don't really do that in Australia. You know, I think we're more likely to make memes out of our leaders than we are to stand up for them. We might respect and honour culture when it comes to sporting, maybe for military or for servicemen. I know some countries are really big on formally honouring your parents. Other countries are actually passing legislation right now where elderly parents who can't take care of themselves anymore can request support from their children who aren't volunteering yet. And just like honour can look different depending on where we come from, the motivations of a culture and honour can also look different in our mind. But I really believe the kingdom of God and God wants to bring us into a united perspective of what a culture of honour looks like. And so that's our first question for tonight. What does a culture of honour look like to God? And I actually think we find a really beautiful base level for this in our scripture for tonight. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. You see, a true culture of honour will always be in the context of and motivated by love. That is what true honour is, which means what honour is not is it is not intimidation or force. You must honour or else. It is not manipulated. I'll honour you if you honour me. 
And the requirement to show honour will never require you to stay in a dangerous, abusive or sinful situation either. If the label honour is attached to those things that is a counterfeit or fake version of it, that is not true honour. But a true culture of honour is not weak, oppressive or archaic. But in God's vision of what a culture of honour looks like, it is actually an irreplaceable way of releasing the power of heaven by redeeming people's understanding of God's love, of their true value and of what it means to step into this fullness of the promise of relationship that we have in Jesus. And I really believe that there are situations that people are facing in this room or even watching online tonight in your relationships. Maybe it's with a family member, with a friend. It could be in a workplace, but there are situations that have been sources of cycles of pain, anger, maybe division. And I believe in some of those situations, they are actually calling for us to give a response of honour. And I believe if we step into that, we're going to see God do incredible things. So tonight, we're going to unpack a little bit further, specifically what that means in those relationships with those people. And we're going to do that by challenging ourselves with three particular questions. How does God see them? How do I see them? And how do I show them. So what is honour? Well, put simply, the Greek word for honour simply means to value or to give weight to something. So it's not necessarily the same thing as respect, and it's not necessarily obedience, although those can be forms of it, but it comes from the time where the weight of the coin determined its value, And attributing value to one another is a key part of how we're called to bring the culture of the kingdom of heaven into our culture today. And we know that because the Bible gives us specific people that we're called to honour. Most important one being God. You know, we don't just go to church or live a lifestyle, but we actually value God. We value that we get to have relationship with Him and we get to have it so freely. Our parents... We value who they are, the fact that they birthed us, clothed us, fed us, put a roof over our heads. We honour appointed authorities. You know, if Peter can say, honour the emperor, when he was probably writing about Nero, who at the time was killing and torturing Christians, then we can honour the appointed authorities in our life. The elderly, they are not a burden. They have so much to give so much that they can teach us, so we value that in them. Our pastors who labour in preaching and teaching, and the last one is kind of a catch-all, and that is we honour one another. And that might seem pretty straightforward, but often we got to address the elephant in the room. And it usually is a question which sounds like this. What if I don't think they deserve it? You know, during this season of being at home a little bit more, I don't know if anyone else has had a moment where they've sort of found themselves doing something and thinking, I thought I was better than this, but I don't know if anyone else has, but I had one of those moments the other week where I found myself not only watching, but enjoying a TV show called Bargain Hunt. Anyone seen that show before? No one took him out? Come on. I don't, no offense if you like the show. I just always thought it was kind of a little bit lame. But if you don't know what it is, basically, there are two teams and they get given a set amount of money. And they've got to take that money and go and browse through some stalls with different antiques. And the purpose of that is to buy these antiques with the intention of selling them at an auction and trying to make the biggest profit margin. That's how you win, right? I'm going to tell you what I find super interesting about this show. Some of the stuff they buy looks like absolute rubbish, right? You look at it and you're like, who on earth is going to pay anything for that? For example, on one of the shows, someone literally bought a turkey pot. Now, that is exactly how it sounds, and we've got a picture of it tonight. Turkey pot. Like, come on, who thinks that is worth anything, right? Because first of all, out of all the animal things you could want in your house, a turkey. Like, no judgment if you got turkey stuff in your house, but all I'm saying is there's better animals out there. Second thing, I found out that these things can actually sell for a couple of hundred dollars. 
Yeah, crazy. I heard that, Jacob, in the back. Oh, I know, right? Crazy. But if there is one thing that this turkey pot has taught me or this show has taught me is that when I'm watching it, it does not matter how I assess the value. It does not matter what I think the value is. The only thing that matters is what the highest bidder is willing to pay for it. That's what determines the value. And the funny thing is, is my thought about that turkey pot is pretty much the exact same thought the psalmist David had about us as humankind when he wrote this psalm about God. Psalm 8, 3 to 6. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Who am I that I would be worth anything to you? And yet, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, crowned him with glory and honour. You give him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. You know, one of the most beautiful things about the kingdom of God is it is not only a place where we receive forgiveness, but it is also a place where God goes even further and he honours us. It's incredible. And we see so many examples of that throughout the Word of God, but none more so than the fact that God valued us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to the cross for us. And when I am in a relationship with that God, it is not up to me to assess the value of anybody else because there is already a higher bidder. It is not up to me to assess whether someone is worth being treated with dignity or with value because have they treated me well this week? What kind of job do they have? Do they look important? I may not understand it, but Jesus loves that person. He died for them. They're made in his image. So it does not matter how big of a turkey pot I think that person is. They are clay formed in his hands. And when the blood of Jesus spilled out for them, it was a message that every single one of us to God is priceless. That is the basis for honour. Now, once we know how God sees people, we may be tempted to respond to that kind of like a child who's just been told by their parents or their mum, you've got to go apologise to your sibling. Like, fine. Like, I don't want to, but for you, I'll do it. Value them. Unfortunately for Jesus, that doesn't really cut it. See, in the Gospel of Matthew, he has this moment where he addresses the Pharisees or the religious leaders of the day who are actually teaching on this topic of honour. And what they were saying was, you know what, I know you're supposed to honour your mum and your dad like you're supposed to, but if you tell them what I would have given to you, I now give to God, you're off the hook. As if you can use your relationship with God as an excuse not to honour other people. Bold thing to preach in front of Jesus. And here was his response. This people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Very interesting choice of words there because Jesus could have said by not honouring one another that he might honour me with their lips but they don't do what I ask. But he didn't. He used the words, their heart is far from me. Just maybe the culture of honour that God wants to build in your life is more than just lip service. It's more than just following a set of rules, but it's actually that he wants to see an alignment of our heart with his in the ways he sees and values other people. A shift in our heart. And we may think, well, what if my heart's not there yet? Like maybe I want to get it there, but if I'm being honest, it's just not there. Well, how do I do this? You know, I don't think there's actually one perfect answer for this, but I do have some rapid fire tips that I think could help if you want them tonight. I think they're pretty good. They're going to come quick, so I hope you're ready for them. Number one, pray for them. Not only is this a great way to give God the opportunity to supernaturally soften our hearts, it's pretty difficult to diss someone when you're praying things like, God, would you bless them? God, would you give them victory in their circumstances? God, would you grow me in love for them? Number two, I told you they were coming quick. Build a mindset of gratitude towards one another. It is way too easy to see the negatives and to go down this road of, everybody in my life sucks. Nobody is there for me. 
Nobody is good enough. And it is such a trap. And we can knock that trap down with this scripture, Philippians 2, 1 to 4. But we'll pull these words. Value others above yourself. When you value someone else above yourself, it is very difficult to think that anyone owes you anything. And that might sound rough, but it's actually great because what it does is it opens us up to this mindset of gratitude, to be thankful for everything we have been given and everything people have done for us. And it's a much better place for us to be. Number three, get away from anything that would try to cultivate or promote dishonour towards others in you. We're going to go after some things right now, and I'm starting with social media. If the inspirational account puffs you up and puts others down, if it gets you to put on a harsh lens towards others, and if, if, if it is obsessed with this magic word calling other people toxic, it is probably not compatible with the way the Word of God wants to shape your view of others. God wants us to keep our heart soft because none of us are above being called out for missing the mark. So if it causes a bitter root to grow, it's got to go. If the account objectifies any gender, the opposite or your own, that ain't good for you. You can't honour what you objectify. If the joke is using sarcasm, as a Trojan horse for a put-down, if it's trying to hide a put-down in humour, that ain't good for you. This week, I just unfollowed an account. It was a meme account, and some of the memes were fire, but then it started using humour to put down people that the Bible calls me to honour, and I don't want that getting on the inside of me. If the conversation becomes a bag-out session, practice gently changing the topic because you don't want other people's negative thoughts or perceptions of another person getting in you. And number four, I actually think this one is very important. Get a vision for who they were made to be. You see, the absence of honour is not just dishonour or disrespect. It's not just back-chatting someone, but it's actually even viewing someone as common. Things like being on your phone while someone's talking to you, thinking, is this really worth my time? Getting too comfortable walking past people being so familiar with people that we fail to see the gold on the inside of them. You know, the Bible says that when Jesus went to his hometown, he couldn't perform any miracles there because of a lack of faith. And it's pretty confronting that the people that we're most familiar with are often the ones that we fail to see heaven on the inside of. And your neighbour may not be Jesus, but they do have God-given character, giftings and potential. So I pray we'd be people who celebrate and honour who people are in God, rather than blocking that person's potential with our low expectations. And potential does not mean they're going to be perfect. The disciples failed so many times, but Jesus still saw them as kingdom carriers. And when we allow that vision of who people are to shape how we communicate and do relationship, just maybe over time, we might see that there is more in that person than the part of them that frustrates us, annoys us, or even hurt us. There is a God image there, so let's be a part of lighting it up. How does God see them? How do I see them? How do I show them? How do I show them their value? Is it saying please and thank you? Helping out? Giving gifts? Is it enthusiasm? You know, I love this one. And I actually think Kanye was onto something in his new song when he said, if I hit you up with the WID, hit me back with the high, with the bunch of I's, and the hey, with the bunch of Y's, because it might sound silly, but it feels good when someone is excited to hear from you or to see you. It makes people feel valued. So let's be enthusiastic about people. Is it going to them if you have an issue? Valuing someone enough to communicate with them rather than giving them the silent treatment. Valuing someone enough to work through it for the sake of the relationship. Is it how we respond in moments where we're faced with dishonour? Because, you know, honour sounds nice, but the truth is sometimes it doesn't take much for us to drop our value of relationship. I don't know about you, but sometimes all it takes to challenge it for me is when someone cuts in front of me in line or interrupts me while I'm speaking or 
invades my personal space, or you hear someone say something that's maybe not so nice about you behind your back. And these might only be superficial examples of things that you've had very real experiences with, with people in your life. But what I pray all of us would see tonight, and what I really believe God wants us to see, is those moments, that hour, where we are most tempted to drop the value of that person or drop the value of that relationship, just maybe those moments are the most important for us to see with fresh eyes. You know, I once heard a political leader talking about a story where she was having a debate with another woman in a room where they were discussing policy. And she said they were on totally opposite ends of the spectrum on a moral issue to the point where the conversation got aggressive and it got personal. And when she left the room, she explained that she felt that she had this loving conviction about how she had just treated this other person. And so what she decided to do was she said, you know, I actually need to bring into this relationship a moment of honour. So she invited this other person back to her room. She made them a drink. And she actually took the time to value them enough to have a personal conversation with them. And she said, you know what, it didn't necessarily change our opinions on the topic, but it absolutely changed the relationship. It changed the tone of the relationship from being hostile and bitter to being one that's now respectful, calm, where we're more inclined to listen to one another. And we've also found that we connect about other things. You know, the scripture that we're talking about tonight, outdo one another in showing honour. The Apostle Paul is talking about in this passage of Romans 12, all these different ways that we are called to put love into action in our relationship. And at the very end of this passage where he lists these things like honour, the last line is very interesting with the words he uses. In Romans 12, 21, he says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome. You know, one of the most dangerous things about dishonour and being faced with it is it tempts us to become exactly like the thing we hate. It tempts us to cancel, to gossip, to clap back, to allow pride into our hearts. And without even realising it, it's tempting us to adopt that very same spirit of division that we just deemed worthy of judgment. And what the Apostle Paul is saying, that notice in that hour when you are faced with that, that you actually have the potential to do something different, to be the change, to do good and to pursue relationship. You know, I really believe that we're living in this time where we are almost become so obsessed with assessing one another that we've actually just forgotten the beauty of simple relationship. You know, simple moments like playing a game together, or sharing a new experience, getting away from the screen and sharing a meal together because the truth is people will always be more entertaining than a TV show, even Bargain Hunt, especially Bargain Hunt. And people will always be more valuable than the hustle ever will be. And I pray this is something that we remember even in times when it gets hard and it gets tough, they are still valuable. So in that hour where our heart gets challenged, in that hour where our hearts get challenged towards somebody else, I pray that we would recognise that that might actually just be the moment not to turn our brother or our sister into an enemy, but to actually reintroduce the power and the beauty of honour back into our hearts and back into the community. And the incredible thing is that is exactly what Jesus did for us. In the hour of the highest moment of dishonour from humanity, where we beat him, we spat on him, we mocked him and we hung him on a cross, the highest moment of dishonour to the Son of God. Jesus took that moment and He decided that that moment would be the moment that forever we would look back to and say, that is how much He values me. That moment right there, that is how much God wants relationship with me.